Again, folks, Mr. Kowalczyk here. <clears throat> uh, home again, sick, sorry. This is no fun, trust me. <clears throat> First thing I do every morning is take a COVID test to see if I'm still positive. And surprise, I am. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and do uh, topic 1.4. We're going to do polynomial functions and rates of change. So yesterday we did linear and quadratics, and today we're going to be doing polynomial functions. So a polynomial function, just to review, is any function in this form here. There's a lot of variables and subscripts and superscripts. Um, but basically, we need n to be a positive integer so that the exponent <clears throat> is a positive integer um, real number for each. Uh, and a to the n is non-zero, meaning this number here in front can't be zero. So we have to have at least one number in there. In this particular case, the um, leading term is going to refer to this right there. So that's going to give us a to the n, or a sub n, excuse me. <clears throat> the degree of this whole polynomial is the highest degree or exponent that we see. So in this case, it would be n, because here we have n, and then we just subtract from each of the exponents in this particular notation. The leading coefficient is just going to, sorry, leading term, I messed that up. It's a n x to the n. So it's that whole thing in front. And then the leading coefficient is just a to the n. That's how I knew I screwed that one up. All right, let's keep going down here. <clears throat> Find the leading coefficient and degree of the following polynomial functions. Leading coefficient here is going to be 3x to the fourth is our, is our um, leading term. The leading coefficient is the number of those there are, so that's going to be 3. The degree is the uh, exponent, so it's going to be a fourth degree. For b, we have y equals 12x minus 7x cubed plus 11. Now, this is they're, they're trying to confuse you with this one here. See if you can figure out what the leading and coefficient and degree are. <clears throat> so in this case, the leading coefficient is going to be negative 7, and the degree is going to be 3. Reminder that we said that it had to be the highest exponent, and in this case, that 3 is the highest exponent, even though it's not in the first position. So really, we would want to rewrite this as negative 7x cubed plus 12x plus 11. That would be in descending order of powers because we start high and go low. Now, the leading coefficient on this one here, we've got gx equals 4. Well, <clears throat> we know that we have to have some kind of exponent here. So another way that we can look at this is we could rewrite this as g of x equals 4x to the 0 power, right? Because x to the 0, anything to the 0 power is just 1. So this whole x to the 0 power really just becomes 1, and we're back here to g of x equals 4. So if we look at it this way, it's easier to see that our leading coefficient is 4, and our degree is actually 0. And that's going to work out, okay? Just some practice with that. Now, <clears throat> extrema is one of the things we're going to be talking about today, is finding the um, maximums and minimums of a function. There are two different types of extrema. Let's make that a little bit clearer. <clears throat> there are two types of extrema. We have relative extrema, or local, and we have absolute extrema, which are global. The relative extrema are our local <clears throat> points, where if we were to look at just an area of a graph, we would say, huh, where is there a, a minimum where it kind of goes down as low as possible and then starts to climb up again? So in this particular case, we have minimums here and here. Some of you might be thinking that we have a minimum here, but if you look closely, there's an arrow there, and that means that it goes down forever and ever and ever. So that is actually not going to be one of our minimums. So we would write out those minimums, it says local minimums at x equals what? Well, our x values are here and here, so that's going to be negative 4 and 0. Now our local maximums are the places in regions of the graph where it goes highest, and that's going to be here and there. So our local maximums are going to be at x equals negative 2 and 3. Okay. Now, when we have globals, that means we look at the entire graph. And all we're looking for is the highest point that it goes and the lowest point that the graph goes. So in this particular case, what we're doing is we're going to say, what's the absolute maximum? Well, that's going to be right here. 
and the absolute maximum equals, in this particular notation, what they're looking for is how high does it go? So it goes to too high at x equals 3, right there. Okay. Now the absolute minimum is a problem because what we talked about earlier is that this downwards arrow <clears throat> means that it's going to go down forever and ever and ever to infinity. So the absolute minimum, there's actually none. We can't count negative infinity as a minimum because you can just keep going down and down and down and down and down. Infinity actually isn't one particular place, it's just an idea. So that one doesn't actually work. There is no minimum there. Uh, one way to think about it is that as our x value increases, y continually decreases. Because it continually decreases, there's no absolute minimum. All right, now let's flip over to example two. Find each uh, and classify each type of extrema for the functions below or write NA. So if we have one of those situations where there isn't one, we're going to go ahead and write NA. Now here, first off, relative minimum at x equals. Well, we see that we've got arrows on both sides, so we can't actually say that there's going to be a minimum. So this is going to be not applicable. The relative maximum is going to be at x equals, right there, at x equals 1. Okay. Now the absolute minimum, again, is NA. And that's not going to count, but the absolute maximum is at how high? Well, it's three units high at x equals 1. Okay, pretty straightforward so far. Let's keep going here. All right, now we've got a different graph. I see that there's a dot there <clears throat> and an arrow here. So my relative minimums are going to be at what? Well, I'm, I'm looking at the whole graph and I'm thinking to myself, where does this go down about as low as it's going to go in a particular region? The only place I really see that is right there. So the relative minimum is going to be right there at x equals negative 2. And then the relative maximums, I see two of those. One I see here, that's, it has a high point there, and it also has a high point right there. So my relative maximums are going to be at negative 4 and 3. Again, my absolute minimum is going to be not applicable because I have that downward arrow that goes on forever, so I can't have <clears throat> a minimum there. But my absolute maximum is going to be at how high? Well, it's at 2 units high at x equals 3. Okay. All right, <clears throat> one more. Now we go and we look at our relative minimums at x equals. Okay, so now in this particular case, I see that I've got a relative minimum here. That's a, 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 kind of the bottom of the graph. And I have another one over here. So that's going to be my relative minimums at negative 3 and 3. My relative maximums, now I've got one here. I notice that's a high point there for that part of the graph. I've got another one here. And if I look carefully, that's a dot right there, not an arrow. So in this particular case, I'm going to have three relative maximums, one at negative 4, one at 0, and 5. Okay. Now my absolute minimum, again, the lowest this graph can go because there are no, no downward arrows, my absolute minimum is going to be right there at negative 3. So it goes down negative 3 units at x equals negative 3. My absolute maximum is way up here in the top corner. And how high is that? Well, that's at 4 units high. And it's going to be at x equals positive 5. Like I said, pretty straightforward, um, pretty cool stuff. We do have some fun facts about polynomials right here. Um, the first one says between two real zeros of a polynomial, there must be at least one blank or one blank. Now, just a reminder, two real zeros. I don't remember if we've talked about this yet this year, but the zeros of a graph, this is where the graph crosses the x-axis. Right? So, for example, if we come up here, that would be a zero and that would be a zero. Even though that's a bump, right, and this is a cross, those are still zeros because it crosses, and I guess I should put or touches the x-axis. Okay, so those are between two real zeros. There must be at least one local maximum. Or 
a local minimum. Okay, we can see that here between these two, we we've got our local maximum right there, um, and then over here on example B, we've got a zero here and a zero here and a zero here. So that tells us that we've got our local minimum right down here between these two. And then between these two, we have our local maximum. Okay. All right. Now, polynomials of an even degree must have either a global maximum or a global minimum. Uh, and the reason for that is end behavior. Just a reminder, if we have an even degree polynomial, what that means is our end behavior is either going to be up, up, or down, down. Okay? That was something that you were taught last year. So um, because we have either up, up, or down, down, that means that no matter what the graph does anywhere in here, we're going to have a global minimum or a global maximum. No matter what the graph does in between those two end behaviors, we'll have those. Okay. All right. Last page here. Points of inflection. Now, this is a really cool vocabulary term that we are going to be using. Um, and I've, I've said it a couple times when I've been talking to you individually about reading these graphs. But basically, a point of inflection occurs when a function changes from concave up to concave down. Um, or from concave down to concave up. But basically it means like when it changes from one concavity to another. That's a, at that point, that's where the graph inflects or changes from concave up to concave down. The rate of change, again, slope of a function changes from increasing to decreasing or from decreasing to increasing at that point of inflection. So let's talk about points of inflection here. Now, <clears throat> the graph of g of x, this is g of x right here, is shown in the figure above. Use the graph of g to answer the following. A says find any values where g has a point of inflection. Now, um, if we look at this graph and we look at concave up to concave down, we clearly start concave up here, right? We're scooping up. We're coming down here. We're still concave up. And then right there, that's our first point of inflection at x equals negative 1. Because we can see how the graph goes from concave up, and then all of a sudden it goes to concave down, right there. So concave down, concave down, continuing across, and then right there, this is going to be our second point of inflection, because from here, we go from concave down, and then we turn into concave up again, right there. So our second one is at x equals positive 1. Right there. And you know what I'm going to do? I am going to color code this and say our concave up is going to be red and concave down is going to be green. Just because. So when I color code it like that, hopefully you can see the difference between the concave up parts and the concave down parts and why those points at x equals 1 and negative 1 are our points of inflection. Okay, <clears throat> last one, I believe. Yep, example B. For each of the following intervals, determine if the rate of change of G is increasing or decreasing. Explain your reasoning for each answer using features of the graph of G of X. Now, I've got a cool um, idea here when I was thinking about, whoops, when I was thinking about teaching this lesson, um, I was trying to figure out how I was going to explain this as best as possible. And I hope I came up with something that makes sense to y'all. Um, kind of a technique for doing this. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the graph. And let me, let me uh, grab a red here. And uh, we're going to look at the intervals. So our first interval is 3, um, <clears throat> three comma 4. And what that means is, does the rate of change of the graph, what does, it, what does it do from here to here? And when we go this way, 3 to 4, it means we're going from 3 towards 4. So we have to read the graph in that, in that way. 
So here's my strategy that I came up with that, I, that works pretty well for this, this type of question. What you do is you think about the slope at x equals 3 of this curve. And the slope's going to change because it's a curve. But one of the things that I want you to think about is if I were to draw a tangent line, which is the line that just barely touches just right at that point, it touches the curve right there. And that would be the line there. That's my first <clears throat> idea, so, excuse me, first slope for this particular um, I, uh, question. And then we go over to four and we draw another slope and the slope on, at four is gonna look more like that, that tangent slope. Right? It just touches the curve right there, and it kind of is going to have to be steeper, and it bounces off. Now, <clears throat> in order to answer this question, what is the rate of change, increasing or decreasing? You're going to compare the slopes. Well, <clears throat> this slope here at 3 compared to this slope here at 4. Is the slope at 4 <clears throat> greater or less than the slope at 3? Well, the answer is it's greater than the slope at 3. Um, because it's steeper in a more positive way, right? It's becoming more positive. So in this case, we would say it's increasing because the slope of g of x becomes more positive over the interval. So let's try that same strategy for our next one. <clears throat> and now we're going from negative 4 to negative 3. So again, we're reading the graph. We're comparing slopes from negative 4 to negative 3. So negative 4, this is kind of like the other side of the graph right here. The slope looks like this. And negative 3, the slope looks like this. Now, you might look at this and say, well, it's just the opposite of the previous example, so it should be decreasing. But again, remember, <clears throat> what we have to ask in, the, in this situation is, what are the slopes actually doing? Well, this is <clears throat> a negative slope because it's going downward, and this is a negative slope because it's going downward also. So both of these are negative slopes at negative 4 and at negative 3. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry about that, guys. The... Um, but the cool thing is, is that because the slope at negative 4 is super steep, and because the slope at negative 3 is less steep, both in a negative, what that means is we're actually becoming more positive. So let's, let, me, let me just assign some made-up numbers here. Let's say the slope at negative, at negative 4 is a negative 10 slope, right? If that's how steep it is. It's negative 10 over 1. Well, another example of a, of a, a less negative slope would be negative 5 over 1. I'm just, like I said, I'm making these numbers up. I don't know what the slopes are, but we could imagine that we've got a really steep negative slope here and a less steep negative slope here. And if we look at negative 10 to negative 5, what we see is that we're becoming less negative as we go from negative 10 to negative 5, which means we're becoming more positive, right? If, if we go more towards the positives from one, from the beginning of the interval to the end, then we are increasing. So in this case, we're increasing because the slope of g of x becomes more positive. Negative 10 to negative 5, for example, is, a, is an example of slopes that become more positive. Okay. Uh, graph's getting a little cluttered up here. Let me erase it, and then we'll move on to our next interval. I hope this is making sense, looking at the slopes of the beginning and the end of the interval. Okay? All right, negative 1 to 1, going that way. All right, so at negative 1, what does my slope look like? It looks like that. That's a positive slope that's going up, right? <clears throat> it's going up, so we know it's going to be a positive slope. And then to positive 1, we have a negative slope. That's all that we need to worry about right now. Yes, there's a local min, max right here, and the graph curves and all that. But all we want to do is we want to compare the slope of the beginning of the interval to the slope of the end of the interval. So if we go from a positive slope to a negative slope, we have to get less positive or decrease. right? Positive to negative, we're going left on the number line when we think about that. So we're decreasing. 
because the rate of change or slope, right, same, same idea of g of x becomes negative. Sorry, more negative. Okay, great. And one more from 1 to 2. Let me erase this so we have a little bit easier to see graph. Okay, so at 1, our slope is negative. And at 2, our slope is flat. So the rate of change, or the slope, went from negative to zero slope. Now a reminder about um, zero slopes, if you've forgotten that one. <clears throat> the slope of a flat line is equal to zero, and the slope of a per perpendic perpendicular or vertical line is equal to undefined. My little shortcut for remembering this came from Ms. Kearney a couple years ago. Some of you remember her. Um, she said, how hard would it be for Spider-Man, or for, for you to walk up, up this hill, right? Uh, or up this wall? It would be impossible, right? It's, un, it's un, impossible, therefore we remember it as undefined. And then she also said, how much effort would it take for you to walk across this, um, this uh, trail if it was flat? Well, it would take zero effort, so the slope is zero. So <clears throat> we know that if we have a flat slope over here at, at x equals 2, then we know that it's going to be 0. Now, if we go from negative to 0, again, that means we're becoming more positive or less negative. Right? 0 is not positive or negative, but you get the idea. We're moving right on the number line when we go from negative to positive. So that means that this is increasing because the rate of change, again, same thing as slope of g of x, becomes more positive. OK, I'm going to stop there for today. I know there's one more down here, but that's a graphing calculator problem that I want to show you in person. Um, I'm really, 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 really hoping that I'm back on Monday. Um, sick of this. Uh, it's, it's so boring and frustrating. Um, but I don't want to get there. Um, I don't want to get anybody sick. So thank you. Uh, please um, make sure that you understand these as best you can. Go up and grab a uh, homework sheet from the sub and please work on that for the rest of class today. If you don't finish it in class, please bring it in on Monday. Thanks a lot. I hope to see you